Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. So once we understand this, we can now start talking about some of the drugs. And the first one is probably the most common one that's used today, and that is the statin drug. The way that you can recognize a statin drug is they end in statin. So a torvastatin, lovastatin, rosuvastatin, simvastatin, these are all statin medications. And what are their effects? Well, they decrease cholesterol and LDL synthesis. How do they do that? Well, going back to this pathway right here, remember that HMG-CoA reductase is the committed step in cholesterol biosynthesis. So if we inhibit this enzyme, then the HMG-CoA is not going to be converted to cholesterol. And so overall, the levels of cholesterol that we synthesize goes down. What happens if our biosynthetic cholesterol goes down? Well, the LDL synthesis will go down because in order to get LDL, we have to have VLDL. And in order to get that, we have to have more cholesterol. So these drugs are thought to lower cholesterol and therefore LDL output. Remember that you can get a lipid panel to determine the levels of your lipoproteins in the blood, like your LDL and HDL. And so theoretically, someone on a statin medication is going to have lower LDL when they get that tested. The other thing that this drug also does is it raises the amounts of these high affinity LDL receptors. You see these on the peripheral cells and on the liver. And so peripheral cells and the liver are better at uptaking this LDL from the blood. So it helps to clear that LDL from the blood as well. These drugs also lower triglycerides, that's what this TAG is, and they increase HDL. Remember HDL is that reverse cholesterol transport or cholesterol scavenger, okay? Now, the negative effects of this drug is they can cause myopathy. And one of the things associated with that is rhabdomyolysis. So if you have somebody who you know is on a statin drug and they come into the clinic and present with any of these three things, myalgia, which is basically muscle pain, muscle weakness, and a dark tea-colored urine, those are indicative that the patient might be experiencing rhabdomyolysis, which is a rapid breakdown of muscles that can be caused by statin medications. And that should be an urgent referral to the emergency room for that particular person. The other thing that these can do is they can raise your hemoglobin A1C and blood glucose. And another important thing here is that they are pregnancy category X. So every drug has a category. There's A through D and then category X. Category X basically means there is no reason ever to use these while you're pregnant, okay? So when you become pregnant, you have a developing fetus in you, okay? Now, cholesterol gets a bad rap. It's actually absolutely necessary for mammalian life. It's a constituent of plasma membranes. It's made into steroids. It's made into bile acids that are necessary for fat digestion. It's really, really, really important. And so in a developing fetus, the statin will also inhibit cholesterol synthesis, and that will cause developmental problems and deformities and is often lethal for the fetus. And so because of that, these are contraindicated and there's no reason to take them. If you find out that you are pregnant and you're on a statin medication, you need to contact your physician immediately and they will tell you to stop it. They may give you something in place of the statin, but you should not take a statin while you are pregnant. They are category X, meaning contraindicated during pregnancy. Now, one other note on statin medications, and I'll go into this more in another video, and it's their effect on primary versus secondary prevention, and it's prevention of things like heart attack, stroke, and so forth. So when we look at primary prevention, that's basically preventing yourself from getting something in the first place. So I'm going to speculate that the vast majority of people watching these videos are young, probably reasonably healthy, and most of you probably have not had a heart attack. And for those of you who have not had a heart attack, hopefully no one ever does, but primary prevention would be doing things, anything, to prevent yourself from having a heart attack in the first place. Secondary prevention would be, once you've had a heart attack, basically preventing yourself from getting any worse and really preventing yourself from having a second heart attack. That's secondary prevention. The reason I mention that is because statins in the Western world are used in primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. However, in primary prevention, there's absolutely no evidence that they work. 
uh, but they're still used. Uh, there are some meta-analyses that have been done on their efficacy for primary prevention, so for people that do not actually have an acute event yet, and there's no decrease in mortality. Their average number needed to treat is around 250. That means that if you prescribed statin medications to 250 individuals who it was actually indicated for, only one of them would have a decrease in mortality. One out of 250. And statistically speaking, you can't even be sure that that was due to the statin. And so for primary prevention, they actually have no decrease in mortality. They're not effective. For secondary prevention, they do have some function. Uh, because at that point, you've already had some kind of a coronary event, presumably. And you're really just preventing yourself from getting any worse. But for primary prevention, interestingly, statins have no effect. Now here's some other drugs that are also used, not as much, and some of them may not even be used anymore, unless for whatever reason the statin is contraindicated. First one, we have niacin. I actually remember for a time my father was on niacin, often called niaspan. This is really just vitamin B3. It's just a prescription dose of vitamin B3. That's what this molecule is, niacin. And its effects are to lower VLDL and LDL synthesis. It increases HDL, which is good and it lowers triglycerides and lowers total cholesterol. The adverse effects of niacin will be flushing, pruritus. Pruritus is really just a fancy term for itching. And then GI effects and dizziness. The third class of drugs here are the fibrates. They also result in lowered VLDO, lowered LDO, lowered triglycerides, lowered cholesterol, and an increase in HDO. But like the statins for primary prevention, these don't show any decrease in mortality for primary or secondary prevention. And so for that reason, the fibrates are really not used anymore. There's really not good evidence for their effectiveness. Then we have what are called the bile acid binding resins. So these are complex molecules that basically bind to bile acids in the GI tract and promote their excretion. So let's look at this. So here's the molecule cholesterol. We have its biosynthetic pathway. And we know that cholesterol can be output to VLDL and eventually LDL. That's what we talked about up here. But through another enzymatic pathway, the cholesterol can be converted to bile acids. Here's one example of a bile acid right here. Now the bile acid is going to be made in the liver, stored in the gallbladder, and then upon eating a fatty-based meal, it will be moved into the small intestine where it will help emulsify fats uh, to allow their absorption and use by the body. But not all of these bile acids are going to be eliminated in the feces. Some will, but a lot of them will actually be recirculated back into the gallbladder where they can then again be reused. And that's called enterohepatic circulation. And it's a way to bypass the elimination of these so you get to actually reuse them over and over and over again. But what do these bile acid binding resins do? Well, they bind to these bile acids when they're in the small intestine, and when they bind to them, the bile acids can't be reabsorbed. So they cannot undergo this enterohepatic circulation. So they really have no choice but to end up being eliminated in the feces. And so what does that do to the amount of bile acids that are reabsorbed? Well, it makes it go sharply down. And so your level of bile acids goes down. So you have to make more of them. So any cholesterol that's made, less of it's going to go to VLDL and LDL, and more of it's going to be used to make bile acids because you're losing more of it. You have to replenish them. And so by shunting this pathway more from cholesterol towards the bile acid, it helps to lower cholesterol and also the LDL synthesis. There's going to be less LDL because there will be less VLDL because there's less cholesterol available for that. It's going towards the bile acids. Okay. And also there's going to be an increase in the amounts of that LDL receptor peripherally and uptake of the LDL. And the reason for that is because there's less LDL. It's a negative feedback mechanism to ensure that more of it gets taken up by these peripheral cells. Okay. So those are the bile acid binding resins. The fifth class of medication is called the intestinal absorption inhibitors. So we did mention that about 75% of cholesterol is made de novo, but the other 25% is taken in through the diet. That's what these drugs target. 
And so what they do is they just simply prevent cholesterol from being absorbed from the intestinal lumen into the blood. And so if it, that process is inhibited, then more of that cholesterol will basically be uh, lost in the feces. Okay, so it decreases cholesterol absorption across the intestinal border and it decreases the total body cholesterol and the total cholesterol that's available for output into VLDL and LDL. And so there's less LDL synthesis, okay? Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.